have um, a one-on-one -on -one topic on passive samplers and how to use them uh, from David Alvarez, uh, the USGS. And in July, we're going to get a little bit technical uh, with some statistics. So how can we move beyond p-values in NRD statistics? And that's going to be led by uh, Richie Erickson of USGS. And uh, we don't have a topic for August yet. We may take a little break. Um, but in September, uh, we're going to have one of our solicitors, Amy Horner Hanley, talk about uh, addressing the question, do I need more science to build my claim? Uh, so that should be exciting, too. Ho hopefully, you guys can tune into that. If you're not on the email distribution list, um, you can contact Samantha Foster. And if you have any topic ideas, you can always drop them in the chat or shoot me an email. And then we have our disclaimer at the bottom that talks about the finding and conclusions are not representative of the DOI or the programs, program, excuse me, and so forth. So I'll let you read that. Um, and as I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here uh, in just a moment, and I will go off camera, um, I did just want to, say that um, again, my thanks to Peter for agreeing to talk about this particular topic. And this, this topic actually came about from the 2020 tribal workshop uh, that uh, the DOI NERDA program hosted with many of you uh, attendees. And uh, there was this, this request to have this, this topic. And so, um, I'm just appreciative of Peter uh, agreeing to give this presentation. And so I am going to stop sharing my screen. And as I do that, Peter, you can go ahead and share yours. And I'm just going to give um, your short bio. Uh, so Peter Mahoney is a Coeur d'Alene tribal member with a bachelor's degree in general studies. Prior to working for the Coeur d'Alene Tribal Lake Management Department, Peter worked in the fields of traditional physical activities and diabetes prevention. And his fun fact, which we like to ask for, is that Peter is one of three Coeur d'Alene's that have helped build a traditional sturgeon nose canoe. So that sounds interesting. I'm not for sure I know what that all looks like. Maybe that has to do with the carving um, of the canoe. Peter, maybe you can explain that to us if we have time later. Uh, so with that, Peter, uh, I see your slides and you should be good to go. Awesome, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you for that, that introduction, Joe. Peter um, Mahoney, Mahoney, in Chichayat Kwa Marlene Means and in Kinet Kwa Edith Zachary. Hello, my friends. My name is Peter Mahoney. Uh, I'm a Coeur d'Alene tribal member. I'm also of Lakota descent on my mother's side. I work for the Coeur d'Alene tribe in lake management. I also wear different hats for the tribe. I serve on our health authority board, which helps oversee policy within our, our clinic, Mariman Health. And I also serve the tribe on our natural resources committee. Um, uh, my Stimilguis, my family, uh, my mother is Peggy Mahoney, my father is Pete Mahoney, my mother's mother was Marlene Means, and my father's mother was Edith Zachary. I'm super excited to be here presenting to you guys today on the topic of uh, traditional cultural knowledge and how it amounts to the exact same thing as science. And it, it's really applicable to teaching in classrooms, and it all just depends on the lens that you, you fr frame your perspective with. That's where I, I definitely see the connection between our traditional knowledges and our traditional teachings and, and science as it's taught in, in schools today. So on the right there, we have our Coeur d'Alene tribal seal. The tribe name circles a drawing of a desk with a book, ink, quill, and a headdress on it. A cross and a map of Idaho are in the background. And in the center, we have um, a picture of our beautiful lake, Lake Coeur d'Alene. And one of our younger tribal members is paddling a sturgeon nose canoe. Uh, that canoe was used by our people for thousands of years. That one right there has ballistic nylon wrapped around the outside, but historically we would have used uh, the bark of a white pine tree. So some things I want you to think about as we're going through the presentation today. Um, number one is how indigenous perspectives can differ from other like Western perspectives. The thought that none of us can change history 
but we can use it to dictate how we move forward uh, together with different tribal communities. Um, and we cannot operate in silos. Uh, one of the big things I want you to take away at the end of this is if you have to work with native communities um, to do research or anything like that, communication and facilitating that communication is one of the most important things that, that you'll ever do when working with tribes. So first, let's talk about what culture is. Culture is the subconscious programming of the mind. So on the right, we'll see this iceberg photo. Um, culture is, is just like an iceberg. The 10% that's above the water, that's above the surface of the water, that's the stuff that you can see. So people's traditions, artifacts, behaviors, historical figures, that's the stuff that's, that's out there in the limelight. But then underneath the surface, you know, things that people aren't really necessarily aware of would be how those people view the world, their assumptions, their beliefs, attitudes, perceptions, values, religion. Those are all things that if you're not part of that culture, you might not necessarily be aware of those different aspects involved with that people. Another really important thing to mention is that culture is not stagnant. It changes and evolves over time. Um, you know, we, we see that today with like the infusion of uh, indigenous cultures along with pop culture. There's also different types of culture. So we have historic cultures, and that would have been the way that people operated hundreds of years ago or thousands of years ago. The, the things they ate, the language they spoke, um, all those different things that get wrapped up into a culture, but in a historic sense. Then we have our modern culture, and that would be the way that Coeur d'Alene people or people of any tribe really carry themselves today, how they talk, the way they view the world, other things like that that we can see on our iceberg over there. Then I also wanted to bring up uh, the idea of pan-Indian culture. If you're not familiar with working with native tribes, uh, there's this kind of stereotype out there that all Native American people are exactly the same, that there's only one type of Native American. Uh, we all speak the same language, we eat the same foods, we do the same things, and that's just not true. There's hundreds of different tribes, um, not only in this nation, but also in Canada and South America. Um, all those different peoples had their own unique languages, their important stories, their important traditional foods, um, and then the ways that they viewed the world can differ in between tribes too. So every tribe is super unique and they need to be treated as such. So let's tackle science. So what is science? Science is the pursuit and application of knowledge and understanding of the natural and social world following systematic methodology based on evidence. So that's how science gets taught in schools today. Um, you're, you're gonna look at your, your evidence and use that to make assumptions about the world and about things that are going on. But then on the other side of that, we have uh, the indigenous perspective, indigenous ways of knowing. And these are based on uh, culturally important knowledge that can differ in between tribes. And it was acquired through thousands of years of hands-on experience interacting with our natural resources and the landscapes in which they're found. Uh, it looks at the tangible and the intangible, and different tribes, like I mentioned, have different ways of understanding the world and the things that are around them. At the bottom here, we have a really cool quote from Chief Seattle. Humankind has not woven the web of life, but we are one thread within it. Whatever we do to the web, we do to ourselves. All things are bound together, all things connect. And that's really, from my opinion, my perspective, how traditional cultural knowledge can, can differ from science, is that we look at the way all things are connected. Things are connected through ecosystems and landscapes. Ecosystems can interact with one another, and we'll get into that here in a little bit as well. So different outlooks have different approaches at, at looking and understanding the world. Uh, this picture right here is from a, it's a science textbook from UC Davis. And it just explains the, the scientific process. So you start with an observation. Uh, the classroom is too warm. And that leads to the question, why is the classroom too warm? And then from that question, you're going to form your hypothesis. The classroom is too warm because no one turned on the air conditioning. And then you make a prediction based on that hypothesis. The air conditioner is turned on, and the classroom will now no longer be too warm. Um, 
I know that's that's a really oversimplified way of looking at the scientific process, but it really, in my opinion, um, kind of captures how how tunnel vision this approach can be. Looking at that hypothesis, uh, the classroom is warm because no one turned on the air conditioning. Maybe the classroom is too warm because the materials the building was made of. Maybe the way it's oriented and its construction towards the sun. There's a lot of different things that could play a part as to why this classroom is too warm. Then on the right, we have this, um, this web of, of connected ideas. Whales are the focal point with humans, salmon, and beavers surrounding it. Um, this story is kind of anecdotal. I don't know which tribe was involved in this, but not that long ago, there was some researchers that were studying why uh, they've seen a decline in killer whales um, off, off the coast of, it was either Washington or Alaska. And so they went to some of the native tribes in that region and they posed the question, how come we're not seeing any more whales or how come we're seeing less whales? And uh, the tribal elder, elders they consulted kept talking about beavers and the, the researchers didn't really know what to make of that. They were saying, no, we're talking about whales. We're not talking about beavers. But what the, the tribal members were trying to convey was the fact that whales eat salmon and beavers help create habitat inland for salmon to spawn and for those, uh, those salmon eggs to hatch and then go back into the ocean to feed the whale. So we look at how these different ideas are, are connected and how the, the two different ecosystems that hold whales and the ecosystems that hold beavers can be connected and interact with each other. Compatibility issues. So a lot of uh, traditional cultural knowledge um, can be orally told. And so with that, there's not a whole lot of it that's written down. It's just passed down from generation to generation. Um, our, our traditional stories, our traditional teachings are usually handed down that way in many tribes, uh, the Coeur tribes, no exception from that. So we see this um, this, this kind of compatibility issue between the, the concept of research. Research represented as a structure being supported by three pillars, measurements, data analysis, and dissemination. Which can require really specific measurements, really specific data analysis, and then the dissemination of that data, how you're going to get it out to the to the public or to the, the stakeholders or the shareholders that are interested in this research. And then on the right there, we have um, a bunch of salmon in the Columbia River. And our people were salmon people here. We fished for salmon up in uh, Spokane Falls. And then we had some other streams on the southern end of the what's now the reservation that had them too and Hangman Creek. And we have stories that are handed down to us about there being so many salmon um, in those areas that you could walk across their backs and never touch the water when they were running. But how do you take the idea that the stream was so thick with salmon that you could walk across their backs and never touch the water and really use that to boil it down to a scientific measurement? A lot of our stuff is anecdotal. We have these stories and, and we know them to be true, but I'm not sure how many fish would have been in that stream at that point in time. So here's a couple more examples. Two photos, a trout fish and a beaver. So we have Elch Tumish and Henmolshench. Elch Tumish is trout and Henmolshench is beaver to the Coeur d'Alene people. This is an example of uh, some of our traditional knowledge that was handed down. Um, one of our elders used to talk about how um, trout and beaver are brothers. And so when they exist in the same landscape together, they flourish and they, they really create habitat for each other. So the beaver is going to end up building his dams. It's going to cause water to build up behind those dams and, and create floodplains. They're going to create better habitat for cutthroat trout to spawn. So we see that, we hear that story, but then we also have evidence of some of our fisheries um, program here within the tribe they've done some stream restoration work and they've seen beavers start to rebuild dams in areas where they were um, missing from the landscape for a while. And now that we have those beavers back in that landscape, we're seeing uh, increased populations of cutthroat trout and increased survivability of, of their babies once they hatch. Um, traditional cultural knowledge can be identified in language as well. Uh, this is our word. Uh, and that means tree bark is loose. That's also the word that we use for the month of April. So what's that, what that is re referring to is um, 
usually in April, sometimes May, depending on the weather. That's when the weather is warm enough for sap to start running in between um, like the cambium layer of wood in a tree and the tree bark. So when that process starts, that's when we're able to start harvesting bark for things like canoes. So these two pictures right here, um, we're actually skinning a white pine tree and the bark is going to be used as the outer shell for one of those canoes. Um, it's also a time of year where we'd start harvesting cedar bark to make baskets or birch bark to make canoes as well. So that, you know, that word slok wyalk, it's talking about a traditional activity, but it's also referring to, you know, a scientific event when that, that sap starts running in between the, the bark and the cambium layer of wood in that tree. Other examples would be uh, the texturing on canoes. So on the left there, we have a, a picture of a coastal canoe. And on the right, we have a picture of a clipper ship. So clippers started to get designed in the 1800s, and they were modeled after the canoes of indigenous people. They were narrower, and so it made uh, them cut through the water a lot better. It actually increased um, transatlantic trade by, by quite a bit because the speed these ships could travel at. But then another really interesting feature that was borrowed from our indigenous canoes was a uh, texturing on the hull of the ship. So I don't know if he can see it too well, but on that bottom picture, that's uh, underneath the bow of a coastal canoe. And you'll see some, some kind of lines that are ingrained into the wood. And those are just these texture lines that help um, the canoe glide through the water. And those texture lines were incorporated into these clipper ships. But then also, you know, they're incorporated into a lot of modern day sail ships as well. So, or I mean, sailboats. So we see this uh, indigenous knowledge that was borrowed and then put into an application for Western use. Cultural resources where science can be found um, when engaging with a tribe. Um, there's all kinds of different places where you, you can find uh, scientific aspects if you know what you're looking for. So you could look at things like traditional stories, um, maybe the, the knowledge that people hand down orally. Um, right now, a lot of our, our like big plants we used to harvest are in bloom. So historically speaking, right now we would have been out digging bitterroot and camas and white camas. And you know, that knowledge is handed down by generations so that we can know when it's okay to harvest these things, how to prepare them, how to cook them, how to store them. Um, but then also, when seasonally is it okay to harvest them without ruining the crop for next year? You look at people's belief systems, their values, and then a really important cultural resource is just people themselves, um, having conversations with individuals uh, to glean what knowledge they may have on a subject but then really being open to what they have to say. Um, you know, if, if you want to talk about whales, but this tribal member wants to talk about beavers, you need to find that cultural connection. You need to, to find out what they're really getting at while they're having this conversation. Circular calendar of five seasons labeled in the Coeur d'Alene language. Uh, this right here is our Coeur d'Alene tribal seasonal calendar. It shows the five different seasons that our people identified historically. So starting at the top and then going to the right, we have spring, summer, fall, late fall, and then winter. And then there's an inner circle that shows different uh, fish, food, um, plants, animals. Those are the different foods that we would have had available during those seasons. Then you go further in and you see our... Um, Lake Coeur d'Alene, the outline of it is the very center of that. And that's because we consider it the spouse of our homeland, the heart of our people. And that's because its waterways connected us to all the different things we had to go to gather to survive. So we would take uh, the different rivers attached to it to go to camping locations, to go pick berries, places on the lake to hunt, to push those, those game animals into the water. Um, you know, it, it was really was centered to our life. Um, this is also a really cool tool that we use in different outreach and education senses um, for when we want to connect um, different aspects of teaching science to Coeur d'Alene culture within the school system we have on the reservation. 
So throughout your work, working with uh, Native American tribes, you might find that indigenous peoples are just wary of the term science. And that has a lot of uh, roots that, that led Native American people to having that feeling. Um, you know, number one, I think on that list would be aspects of genocide and, and ethnocide that Native American peoples have had to endure, whether that was through, um, you know, forced marches on the, the Trail of Tears or being relocated from their homelands into different parts of the country. Uh, you look at kids being shipped off to boarding schools all across the country, um, the loss of our people to disease. A lot of those things really caused uh, traumas within our communities, within our people that we're definitely working through. Um, you know, we have that historical trauma. And then today, I one of the biggest issues I see is uh, the issues of alternative facts and therefore like leading that to alternative history. So I have a couple, you know, local examples. So on the bottom left, um, that's a monument here locally to the soldiers that passed away at Steptoe Butte, which was one of the battles the, the Coeur d'Alene tribe and surrounding tribes had with the U.S. Army. Um, and to this day, that battle gets painted in a different light than what actually occurred, you know. So our people were gathered at uh, uh, one of our traditional campsites, and we were there with other tribes gathering roots and just enjoying time together, you know, um, harvesting our traditional foods. And Colonel Steptoe was, he, he was going up to Colville country to investigate some miners that had been killed. And he decided to pop through Coeur d'Alene country and have a show of force. And we, we took that as a threat. We asked him multiple times to leave. You know, he, he was getting too close for to women and children and he refused to do that. And so, so battle broke out. And then once the battle had, had subsided on May 17th, um, we struck a deal with him that we would let him leave if he uh, were to leave his his munitions and his cannons and things like that. And so he did. Uh, he took off with his men and they went back to Fort Walla Walla. But now that story gets gets painted in a different light where um, Colonel Steptoe and his soldiers had this really dramatic, brave dash for freedom where they gave all the natives the slip and we were we were o o over celebratory about our victory and he eluded us and, and made his way through our camps to freedom. And that's just not the case. Um, the, the state of Washington today for their uh, historic um, marker and, and pamphlet they have for this battlefield site really paints that story in a light that's just untruthful. It's not what actually happened in that event. And then on the right, we have Treaty Rock. Uh, it's a historical landmark up in Post Falls in Northern Idaho. And supposedly, this is where a man named Frederick Post um, made a deal with one of our chiefs to receive the land um, that he used to build a lumber mill. And uh, th that's a disputed fact as well. But the founding of the city of, of Post Falls is based on this story. And there is just differing accounts uh, as to the factuality of that actual land exchange. So we have these... Um, events were painted much differently in history books than actually occurred. And that kind of creates a distrust um, between tribes and, and other communities at large because our history is not being taught in a way that, that represents what we believe happened and, and you know, different journals, um, different things that we have read have shown our version of events to be true. In the name of science. So for the past few hundred years, Native American people have really been used um, as guinea pigs through a lot of different, um, I guess, scientific practices. If you look at uh, archaeology, um, you know, a lot of different Native tribes look at what happened with archaeology leading up to the, the 1970s and even past that as, as akin to grave robbery. Um, people came in uh, unregulated, just taking artifacts or looting grave sites. There was a lot of really bad stuff that happened. Um, and then in the, I think it's 1990, the NAGPRA Act got passed, which is the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. 
Um, and that was meant to protect Native American graves and to, to give us a chance to reclaim those artifacts or those individuals whose um, bodies were taken from our, our homelands, uh, get those back and, and take care of those in a good way that we think is culturally fitting to take care of them. Um, there's a part of the archaeological community today that doesn't believe that there should be protections over Native American graves and artifacts just because they think it, it introduces um, creationism, or the argument is that it introduces creationism into archaeology. Um, I don't know. It, it's, it's a weird thing. These uh, archaeologists want to be able to go and, and do work in important historic sites for these tribes without necessarily looking at why those tribes want those areas to be protected. Um, you know, our, our people are still here. We're not talking about extinct tribes that aren't going to be able to fight back against our, our people's artifacts and remains being taken from our lands. Um, anthropology. Anthropology, I mean, you can look at the, um, I guess, the American eugenics movement of the early 1900s. And a lot of Native American skulls from different areas were taken so that they could be measured in an effort to prove that our, our brains were smaller than uh, Euro-American settlers. And then more recently, we have uh, different, you know, um, the practices of medicine, that sort of science. Uh, up until 1978, Indian Health Service was sterilizing Native American women. Um, sometimes forcibly or without their consent or by having them sign forms they didn't know how to read or necessarily understand. Uh, the UN put together a report in 1977 talking about the, the genocidal tendencies the government has had towards Native Americans. And the uh, forced sterilization of women was talked about in that report. And at the time, the UN estimated that um, up to 25% of Native American women had been sterilized by the U.S. government. We've also seen different tribes uh, being taken advantage of. There was a Southwestern tribe, I think in the 80s, they uh, asked some, some researchers at uh, Arizona State to do some blood work on them to find out if their people were genetically um, inclined towards having diabetes because they had a really bad ep uh, diabetes epidemic on the reservation. So these re researchers went and took that blood work and then the tribe discovered later on that their blood samples were being used to um, look at things like uh, mental health issues and how they might pop up in Native American communities by looking at their blood um, to see if those things were, were handed down genetically. And that was something the tribe had no idea was going on. They, they didn't want that to happen. When they made that agreement to have this researcher examine their, the blood work from their community, they were hoping to find um, out more about diabetes. They didn't think that they were going to be used as guinea pigs and then seeing their blood referenced in dozens of uh, research papers decades later. So on the right, we have a, a photo from the Smithsonian. It just shows a man, you know, measuring different skulls. And then on the left, we have a uh, picture that came out of a pamphlet from a human, I think it's Education and Welfare Department of the federal government. And it was just trying to convince Native families not to reproduce, basically. And it was showing in a very, very stereotypical fashion that if you have less children, you'll be more wealthy. And wealth right there is, is shown in terms of how many horses you might have. Um, the family on the left has a lot of kids and they only have one horse. That's another interesting thing because it really forces this Western perspective of wealth on Native Americans. And for a lot of different tribes, um, the idea of wealth was not how, many, how much stuff you had, how many horses you had. It was about how many things you could give away. So we quantified wealth in a very different way. And this is uh, an example of uh, that Western culture being forced upon us. Oval infographic. The base is historical context. The center of the oval is building a new narrative. At the top center is values. To the left is relationship building. And to the right is knowledge and skill building. 
so now in 2021, um, tribes are getting a lot better at protecting themselves from things like this happening to us. Um, we're really taking matters into our own hands to make sure that our people are protected. And right here we have a, it's, it's um, a map put together to help show people how to build, um, you know, new narratives with Native American communities. And it helps address people that you might want to be speaking to if you're working with a tribe, as far as government leaders or policymakers or community members. And then also it shows um, possibilities on how to build up your skills with working with Native American tribes so that you can help, you know, have those inroads. And a, a lot of it is just about developing policies and establishing clear guidelines so that if you're working with the tribe, the tribe knows what's happening and they know what you're doing and you're doing it in a culturally appropriate way. Tribes protecting themselves. Uh, these are some examples of what our tribe does. So if you're going to do any research on the Coeur d'Alene Reservation involving the Coeur d'Alene people, you have to, to fill out an application to do so now. And the introduction on the left, research is the pursuit of knowledge and it's a sacred undertaking. Thus, it is the Coeur d'Alene tribe's expectation that research conducted within our homeland is done so with respect for all members of our community, including people, plants, animals, water, and land. That is done with reciprocity, understanding its benefits to both the researcher and our community. That researcher does so through relationship in our community that embraces and upholds our five pillars. Um, our five pillars are the, the five core values we have as Coeur d'Alene people that represent how we view the world and the things that we hold dear. So on the right, we have those pillars, uh, membership, and that's membership to your, your community, your tribe, um, and the world, and being a good person. And we have Sni and McWilpin, uh, long life, holistic learning, um, that's scholarship. Atskantwesh is stewardship. And that's to take care of things with integrity and responsibility and accountability. Um, guardianship is to protect our, our tribal ways of knowing and making sure that they're protected. And then we have uh, spirituality, faith in which the creator reveals connection between all life. That goes back to the idea that spider web that I brought up um, from Chief Seattle, that all things are, are connected. You know, people didn't make the, the web of creation, creator did. And so all the different pieces connect to each other. And although things may not seem related, um, usually they are in some way. And then on the bottom left, we have uh, the very first question you'll see if you're filling out a research application. I mean, besides saying who you are and, and what you're affiliated with, the number of question is, how will this project benefit the Coeur d'Alene tribe and its members? Um, we don't really, like we, have the, the capabilities of doing our own research. So if someone else wants to come in and do research projects on the reservation, they need to prove to us that it is something that will be valuable to our people. You also need to show um, uh, you know, what other outcomes that may come out of the research. Um, yeah, this is how we, we protect our people and our tribe and our cultural knowledge in, in 2021. So, what are some things that you can do when working with uh, tribal communities? So the number one thing I'd suggest is to figure out the proper flow of communication and the protocol. So tribes may have a research application like, I, like the one I just showed you. So if you were gonna come and, and do research within the tribe, you would need to identify if you need to fill out a research application, um, you need to prove how it will benefit the tribe, uh, you need to figure out how that, you know, that thing needs to get routed, who it needs to go through, who needs to sign off on it. Um, and then different communities will have different ways of passing along that information. Um, another really, it, it can't be understated how important the second one is, and that's to just build relationships. Um, building relationships with tribal members and establishing that trust and if you are really here to help us, um, that will come out through the relationship building process. Uh, we've had several uh, medical professionals that have come into our community over the years working at our clinic, and those people really ingrained themselves into our community by um, 
being present at, at a lot of our events. They, they come to funerals, they come to powwows, they come to uh, storytelling events. They just take the opportunity to really become part of our community. And then we look at them as a, a trusted member of our community. Um, look through a different lens before framing your questions. I've seen a lot of people come into our community and the question they're asking may not be necessarily a bad question, but the way they frame it can be kind of insulting. Um, you know, I, I don't think that tribes want to see anyone come onto, onto their land and try and tell them how to fix whatever problem they might be encountering. Um, there, there's ways to ask those questions that are culturally sensitive and culturally appropriate and will also help with that relationship building process. And then finally, do your homework. Uh, if you're gonna propose some sort of research on a reservation, you should find out if that has already been done, if the tribe has data on that, if that's something they even need. Um, and then beyond that, uh, depending on what answers you get to those questions, you can look at um, a historical precedent for whatever you're trying to accomplish. So there's a lot of work you can do to, to get ready to work with whatever Native American community it might be. Um, and then on that, that subject of do your homework, um, listen to what people have to say when you come into that community. You can't walk in and act like you, you know everything and you, you know about the entire culture of a tribe, but really you, you've just read about it in books and you haven't talked down and spoken face to face with people. Those are all uh, really important things that I think will help build um, healthy relationships between researchers in the scientific community and Native American tribes. Here we have uh, some of the resources I used to put together the presentation. And now we'll get to questions. Peter, thanks so much. Um, lots of um, great illustrations there, and I'm I'm sure we're going to have some questions. So, folks, um, you can raise your hand uh, if you'd like to um, ask a question, or you can type it in the chat feature, uh, which is that little bubble with the lines up top. Um, let's see. Uh, looks like Suzanne Dunn has a question. Suzanne, you want to unmute yourself? Hi, yeah, great presentation. Um, I was wondering, um, when it comes to attending, you know, how I was and, and those types of things, um, I never knew, do we ask for an invitation to a powwow? Um, are they open to the public? I I work with a number of tribes, and I I've been interested to, um, you know, attend some of their powwows to learn more about their practices. But I didn't know if it was appropriate for me to go. So how would you suggest I go about that? Um, I think looking at powwow, uh, a lot of those are more commercial events, and you can find different ways those are advertised. Um, sometimes they'll pop up on social media. And, and things that are advertised like that are probably okay to attend. Um, but then there's like, I guess, traditional dances every tribe may have. Like we have winter dances and those are usually closed ceremonies that outsiders aren't um, invited into. And then if you do attend powwow, if you identify um, one of these events to go to, just take in mind that, um, you know, that can be a, a pan-Indian event. And so these powwows are, a bunch of people, a bunch of Native Americans from a bunch of different tribes and cultures coming together um, to dance. And some of those dances may not be specific to any one tribe. A lot of tribes may do them. Uh, a powwow may have uh, bits and pieces of it that are unique to the hosting tribe. And so uh, it's a good place to, I think, build connections with a community. Um, but there may not be a whole lot of super relevant cultural information happening at powwows that's unique to any one tribe. So Peter, there was a question earlier in the chat um, from Trina asking about the, the calendar that you showed and is that available to the public? Uh, we've used it in, in different ways. I'm not sure if we have it online, but I can send the link out to you, Joe, and then if anyone's interested, you can send it out to them. Okay, sure. Thank you. 
Other questions for Peter? Go ahead and raise your hand or come off mute. Uh, Matt, or it looks like Larry may be trying to come on too, but uh, Larry, did you have a, a comment or question? I just uh, typed in, ma'am, uh, Larry Tippett, you were in Tribe Environmental Department. I'm a Seneca Tribal member. That's one of the best presentations I've ever listened to. And I want to thank you for really expressing the Amer Native American perspective. Thank you. I, I appreciate your words. Uh, let's go over to Matt. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yes, I, I enjoyed the presentation very much. Um, and, you know, promulgating the information about the history and the different perspectives on it is, is super important. I really appreciated that. Um, and, um, you know, that we, it's about communication in a lot of ways and, um, trust between groups and, um, in my own experience, it's been hard to, to, to break through that trust. And I, I just haven't had the opportunity to do so as much as I would like to, despite working with some of the groups that Larry also works with, um, I believe in, in Oklahoma and, um really appreciated the perspective and about just the interaction with the natural world but also the the historical perspective of of uh trust or lack thereof between um the tribes and and states and and governments of the US generally <laughs> so thank you for going through that painful bit of history and acknowledging that yeah of course I'm I'm I like giving presentations like this because I think that for you know our, our governments to all work together to to really accomplish something that's in in the best interest of all the parties we need to be able to have open conversations and break down stereotypes and and just realize that you know when sometimes we might reach an, an impasse and at that point we really need to to rely on these conversations to help build those relationships and see things from different people's perspective. And I'm sorry um, because I didn't turn on my camera before starting that conversation, which would have been a nice thing to do. So I'm just turning it on now to say hello and show you a face and um, uh, hope that uh, I, I can integrate my work more with the tribes and um, and, and contribute to the incorporation of TKE into the work that we do. Very good. Thank you for what you do. <laughs> so, Peter, there's a question in the chat from Christina who asks, if we are just trying to connect with the tribe for the first time, is there a common person or role who would be the first person in the tribe that we reach out to in order to have that first contact? Um, I think that it depends on the nature of the contact you're trying to have. So, um, I mean, if you're hoping to to do research on the R Coeur d'Alene Reservation, um, one of the first contacts uh, would probably be our Department of Education, because that's where uh, the majority of our people who are on our research committee sit. And then from there, that information can get passed on to, to the relevant personnel. So maybe if you're trying to contact a tribe, get a hold of their tribal government and then figure out from there a good contact person. They might not point you towards the right person to begin with, but at least they can show you where to start. Great. As, as maybe a, a follow-up question to that. Um, under the Biden administration, there's new priorities, and, and one is um, related to tribal sovereignty and there's just been a lot of interest obviously that uh, we have our first Native American secretary in, in Deb Holland and within the the NERDA program the DOI NERDA program I mean there's been a long history of tribal connections on various cases so this isn't new with the new administration um, with the new administration's priorities but 
Beyond what you've already shared, is there there's some advice that you would give folks in engaging so that it doesn't I mean we don't want to seem like any engagement is just checking, you know, a current box. Um, and so beyond, you know, building those relationships and, and is there any other advice that you'd give to folks on how to engage and, and maintain relationships? Um engaging and maintaining relationships i think the like even after you've done your your quote unquote work or whatever you're trying to accomplish um you know maintain those relationships with the tribal members that that helped you you accomplish that work um i think that that networking is an, an extremely important thing that we can all do in our, our professional and our personal lives and you never know when having a a conversation with a person can help connect a dot or maybe connect you to another person that, that's relevant in a, a different line of work or on a different project. Um, you know, we, we've seen people come and go on within our reservation, within our tribal community. And that's because, you know, once a project's over, they, they fold up camp and they take off and we never hear from them again. We don't know what happened to that, that research or data. We don't know uh, what that person really intended to begin with. They just kind of, you know, they, they ghost on us. Yeah, I was just listening to a presentation earlier today and just the language that even uh, some tribal documents have that stress belief in community. And, and I was thinking about community when you were just describing that, that it's not just about gathering the, the data, so to speak, but um, investing in relationships and, and the community and, and becoming um, a part of that system, not just um, someone that comes in for, um, for their own information. Mm -hmm. um, Nancy has her hand raised. Nancy, would you like to come off mute? Hi, um, so I've been working in NRD for about two years. And there's cases that we work with different nations and tribes. And I know that you're not part of this nation and tribes and uh, cultural practices and perspectives may be different, but there's been some historical tension between um, the tribe and us on some cases. If I'm new and like, like you said, suggesting to do your homework, is it better to like, do more like online research or is it better to like try to talk to people more um saying like i know that there's been historical like um i don't know tension's the right word but like um how do i improve communication when i'm new in a situation how would you recommend doing that i think that um you know it's a combination of the two things you mentioned it's about doing some online research but then also like boots on the ground, having face-to-face uh, -face conversations with people too, if that's possible or over Zoom or over the phone. I don't know what COVID restrictions look like where you're at. Um, and then maybe finding out what predecessors in your position or in your department have done, um, what led to those tensions. And then I think too, it's really important to, to look at the, the tribal perspective on what caused that tension. It, it could have been something you know, as, as small as a miscommunication. Um, yeah, there's there's all kinds of examples of that. We have a, it's not really an example of, of miscommunication, but just ignoring the tribal perspective. Um, our tribe won uh, uh, several cases to do with our lake, our traditional waterways. And, you know, we have this uh, designation of the, of our Lake Coeur d'Alene as a Superfund site. And so we have all kinds of the toxic materials from mining that are coming out of the Coeur d'Alene into the, the top half of our river and we've, or into the top half of our lake. And we've had this uh, lake management plan for several years between us and I think it's EPA in the state of Idaho. Um, but instead of, you know, figuring out what we gotta do to make this lake management plan happen and clean up our lake, uh, some of those other agencies have just spent their their time over the last, 10, 15 years just rechecking our science. And you know, what they're finding out is the fact that the lake's in worse shape now than what it was when the lake management plan was created.
So there's another question, question in the chat uh, from Gwen. What is truly appropriate? Traditional ecological knowledge versus tradi traditional cultural knowledge? Um, in my mind, those are, are one and the same. Um, I think I like the word cultural better than ecological, just because the culture is going to encompass all those different things, how all these animals or plants or whatever they are interacted with each other, and then how people interacted with those landscapes as well. Um, I prefer culture, but I think they're interchangeable. Okay, Chris, Dina, oh, looks like um, someone came off mute. If, if you did, go ahead and ask your question. I think that was me. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, hi, Peter um, and everyone on the call. I'm on the phone. Uh, my name is Winona Wilson. I'm the Senior Tribal Policy Advisor for EPA Region 10. I'm also a citizen of the Colville Confederated Tribes, and I just wanted to compliment you, Peter, on such a fantastic presentation. I'm really sorry I couldn't see it. Um, but my link didn't work, so I, I was paying very close attention on phone. But I, I did want to get your perspective on, on something. Um, one thing I've been thinking about here at EPA is, you know, we, we um, need to defend our decisions. And uh, we've, I've, I've been really thinking about how we can do a better job um, utilizing uh, TEK in our decision making. But where I get very nervous, and as a tribal member, um, is uh, putting things into uh, federal documents that are really m more private uh, to a tribe. So I I've actually been thinking about this my whole career and have come up with some best practices. But I did want to know if you had any thoughts toward that, toward privacy and FOIA and, um, and, and still being able to use information and decision making. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'd actually be really interested to look at your, your best practices um, and, and what you've kind of thought up already. Putting things down in, in documentation, um, my understanding is that our, our elders here didn't necessarily like to do a whole lot of that. Um, we need to protect our knowledge so that we can pass it on to future generations. So that's that, that's a really uh, tricky place to be in, and I think uh, people working for tribes are in a lot of the same boat across the country. Yes, well, maybe we can talk after, because uh, I'm also interested in having you come speak to um, all of our personnel. So, But let's talk more, and I can talk about some of those best practices. I mean, one is to try to figure out how to never make it become a record. But then again, the defensibility is is um, is, is then may not be intact. So uh, yes, I'd love to follow up with you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So Christina asked another question in um, the the chat, and I won't won't read it all other than I, I feel like folks may, are, you know, we're worried sometimes if we're um, not from the, the indigenous community that we would like to uh, work with or collaborate with about saying the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing. Um, and so she, Christina notes that, um, you know, the appropriateness of dress when, um, if, if you have some Native American jewelry or, or have different, um, more what may be seen as um, indigenous type dress, does, is that offensive or would it come off negatively? Any um, comment on that? Um, personally speaking, I don't think it would be super offensive. Um, and I guess my perspective on that is that I'm extremely pale for a Native American, not that skin color matters in any way, shape, or form, but there's no way to tell who's Native American and who's not. Like if, for all I know, if I saw you wearing some, some beaded earrings, I might walk up and ask what tribe you belong to. So I, I wouldn't worry too much about it. 
Great, yeah, and and there was another comment saying that the vast majority would, would be neutral. Um, but if you're wearing a particular nice piece, you might be asked if you knew who made it. Um, you might be asked to if, if you knew who made it or if it had like a really like something super identifiable, like a, a specific animal or something. You might be asked like the history behind that. We have only a few minutes left. We have one last burning question for Peter. Well, if not, Peter, I would just like to thank you so much again for your time. I think uh, it, it was just fantastic, like you've heard from several folks. Um, we we will hopefully, with Peter's permission, share the slides so the folks that were on the phone can at least go back and look at them, and and uh, hopefully we'll have the recording up soon as well. Um, so with that, Peter, thank you once again. Um, just really appreciate your time today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I was super excited to give the presentation and uh, look forward to working with some of you in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your afternoon.